بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing with Zad al-Mustaqna, the chapter of Hajj and Umrah and issues pertaining to that Imam al-Hajjawi rahmatullahi alayhi, he has us at the chapter Babu al-Ihram The book, sorry, the chapter pertaining to the Ihram Sheikh Mansur, hafizahullah, he says Shar'an niyat al-Dukul fi al-Nusuk that ihram technically is to enter into the rituals of hajj with intention is to have the intention to enter into the rituals of hajj and it's not pertaining to the intention that one wants to go on hajj or umrah because that intention of wanting to go to hajj or umrah that is already there from the time the person has left his house, he's going to Hajj or Umrah, that intention is already there. لكن الإحرام يتطلبس بالنسك الحج أو الأمرة But rather the Ihram is to have the state of mind and the state of heart, the intention to now understand that you are now entering upon the rituals of Hajj themselves and you are now in the state of Ihram, the state of being a muhrim. سمي الإحرام إحراماً the Ihram was given the name Ihram. Does anybody know why? Is there anybody there that can answer the question? Ihram. Why does it have the name Ihram pertaining to Haram? It's because the Muhrim bi Ihramihi harram ala nafsihi asha kanat mubahatan lahu qabla dakhul fi nusuk. Because the Muhrim, the one who is in the state of Ihram, going for Hajj and Umrah, he has now entered upon a state where things which were previously permissible for him have now become haram for him due to him being in the state of ihram. For example, katib wa nikah wa sayyid. For example, using perfumes, um, getting married, and hunting, as well as other matters which are now haram. So there is a link between the word muhrim and the state of ihram to the word that we understand haram, forbidden. Because things are now forbidden upon him because he's entered into the state of ihram. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, Al ihram niyatun nusuk. The ihram, it is the intention to enter upon the rites and rituals of hajj or umrah. Al ihram yurad bihi niyatun dukul fil nusuk. Sheikh Mansur says, Al ihram is the intention to enter upon the rites of hajj. Min hajjin aw umratin aw huma ma'an. From either hajj aw umrah or both of them together. وعلى هذا إذا هذا الميقات if the person comes to the closest of the miqat فإنه ينوي أن يدخل في هذه النسك then the person has to intend that he's now going to enter into one of these rituals of Hajj or Umrah ويكون حينها محرما عليه ما على المحرم and from this point on it will be haram not allowed for him that which is not allowed for the محرم because he now becomes a محرم ولا يشترط في نية الدخول في النسك تلبية and it's not a condition for the person to enter into the rituals of Hajj or Umrah that he has to make talbiya. ولا سوكو حدي Nor does he have to bring the hadi, the sacrificial animal. لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إنما الأعمال بالنيات The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the famous hadith that intention actions are tied to their intentions. فيدخل فيه بمجرد النية So the person enters into the state of being a muhrim, into the state of ihram with the intention solely. He doesn't need anything else. لكن يستحب النطق بالتلبية But it's recommended that the person states the talbiya إظهارا للنسك As a way of showing the rituals of Hajj and Umrah The author he says May Allah have mercy upon him وَسُنُّ لِمُرِيدِهِ غُسُلْ It's recommended, it's sunnah for the person who's going to enter into the ihram that he or she takes a ghusl uh, In the hadith in Tirmidhi of Zayd ibn Thabit he said, رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ تَجَرَّدَ لِإِهْلَالِهِ وَاغْتَصَلْ I saw that the Prophet ﷺ removed his clothing for his state of ihram and he took ghusl. So it is ghusl is sunnah pertaining to the one who wants to enter into the state of ihram and wearing the ihram. وَصِفَةُ الْغُسْلِ كَغُسْلِ جَنَابَ The description of the ghusl is like that of the ghusl of janaba. وَيَكْفِي تَعْمِيمَ الْمَا بِأَيِّ تَرِيقَةٍ كَانَتْ and it suffices that the body is covered with water in any which way, shape or form. Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, he says that even the ha'id can make this ghusl because this is a ghusl for the ihram. It's not a ghusl for purification. It's a ghusl for the ihram. 
The author, he says, أَوْ تَيَمَّمُنْ لِعَدَمٍ He says, the person can make tayammum, the dry ablution with dust, and uh, it's like if there is no water. Sheikh Mansour says, إِذَا لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ الْمُحْرِمْ الْإِخْتِسَالِ If the person, the person in ihram, the muhrim, cannot make the ghusl, إِمَّا لِعَدَمِ الْمَا Either due to an absence of water, أَوْ لِخَوْفِ الدَّرَرْ بِإِسْتِعْمَالِهِ Or due to some harm that may fall upon him if he uses water, like sickness or something of that nature. إِسْتُحِبَّ لَهُ أَنْ يَتَّيَمَّمْ Then it's recommended for the person that they make tayammum instead of ghusl. لِأَنَّ التَّيَمَّمْ يَحَلْ مَحَلِ الطَّهَارَةَ الْمَاءَ الْوَاجِبَةَ وَالْمُسْتَحَبَةَ Because uh, the tayammum يَحِلْ will take the place of the, um, of the purification with water. Okay, which is done due to obligatory purification or done due to recommended purification. So what he's saying here in the conclusion, the author is saying that if you cannot make ghusl due to an absence of water, or you cannot make ghusl because the water is going to harm you, then instead what you can do and it's recommended for you to do is to make tayammum. Because tayammum takes the place of purification which is obligatory or purification which is recommended according to this opinion. However, there's another opinion in the madhab where some of the ulama say, such as Shaykh Islam ibn, uh, ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala and Shaykh Islam ibn Qadama rahimahullah uh, they hold the opinion that you shouldn't make tayammum in this situation. So for example ibn Qadama in his book Al-Mughni in the fifth volume page 76 he says وَالصَّحِيهُ أَنَّهُ غَيْرُ مَسْنُونَ The correct opinion is that it is not recommended, it is not sunnah to make tayammum. لِأَنَّهُ غُسْلٌ غَيْرُ وَاجِبٌ Because it's a ghusl which is not obligatory. فَلَمْ يَسْتَحِبُ وَالتَّيَمَّمْ in the adamihi كَا غُسْلِ الْجُمَّةِ Therefore, due to the absence of water and not being able to use water, it's not recommended that you use tayammum instead. وَالْفَرْقُ بَيْنَ الْوَاجِبُ وَالْمَسْنُونَ And the difference between a wajib a ghusl and a sunnah a ghusl, أن الواجب شرع لإباحة الصلاة that the wajib ghusl has been legislated for the person to be able to enter into the prayer وتيمم يقوم مقامه في ذلك and تيمم can replace water in that particular situation والمسنون يراد للتنظيف and with regards to the sunnah ghusl what's intended therein is beautification and removing filth and harm from oneself وقط رائحة وقط أي رائحة and to remove uh, bad body odors والتيمم لا يحصل هذا and doing تيمم doesn't bring about this benefit بل يحصل شعثا وتغبيرا but rather it brings about that the person is going to be dusty and disheveled so in conclusion Ibn Qadam's opinion and Ibn Taymiyyah is that with regards to this situation because it's a ghusl which is not wajib then the tayammum cannot take its place because the tayammum according to them can only take the place of that ghusl which is for a wajib reason, okay, like in order to be able to pray. The author he says, وَالتَنظِيف فَيُسْتَحَبُّ لِمَنْ أَرَادِ الْإِحْرَامِ أَنْ يَتَنَّظِّفُ It's recommended for the one who wants to get into the state of ihram that he makes tanzif. Tanzif is that he purifies his, his uh, clothing um, and he does things like cutting off his nails etc. As Sheikh Mansour says, that the intent here is to take the things which are known as Sunnah al Fitra and to remove any harmful body odors, such as you know that which comes from sweating a lot. And then he cuts his fingernails and he trims down his mustache. وَيَحْلِقْ آنَتَهُ And he removes his pubic hairs وَنَحْوِ ذَلِكْ And that which is like that. So when the ulama they mention a tanzif, the word tanzif, and they mention, mention the word ghusl separately, they both mean the same thing. It basically means uh, taking ghusl, okay, and purifying oneself from impurities. But when they are mentioned together like they are here, then ghusl has the intent of meaning specifically the bath, and tanzif is what we mentioned from removing bad body odors and removing your nails, your hair from your moustache, trimming down your beard, uh, removing your body hairs, etc. Now this issue of tanzif, even though it's not reported by the Prophet ﷺ authentically that the Prophet ﷺ did it in the sense that there's no hadith authentically which mentions that the Prophet ﷺ said to do this. However, we have one of the imams of the Tabi'een, Ibrahim al-Naqa'i, 
rahimahullah ta'ala, who said that they used to do that. And when he means this word, they used to do that, the ulama say it can either mean that the Sahaba used to do this, tanzif, removing the body, hairs, etc., and clipping the nails, etc., or it could mean that the a'imma of the tabi'in, the imams of the tabi'in used to do it, and it was something which is well known and widespread. So Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, he says that if that be the case, then it's something that can be taken as being mustahab, that this should be something which is done for the person who's about to go into ihram. And also because if the person leaves his hair, his body hair, and he doesn't cleanse himself from bodily odors, and he doesn't cut his nails or trim his moustache, then he will find that in the days of being in the ihram, that he may need to do these things. And if he does these things whilst being in ihram, then he will have to pay a penalty. So it's better for him to do them if there is a need before he gets into the state of ihram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The author, he says, what tayyub. It's also recommended, a sunnah, that the person does tayyub. A tayyub wa tayyib liman arada nusuk wal ihram lahu mawdu'an. Shaykh Mansur says that the one who wants to get into the state of ihram for hajj or umrah, then there are two places that it's sunnah for the person to put on the perfume, to put on the tayyib. The first of them, lil badan, the body itself, kalwaj wa ra's wa lahya wa nahwiha. Like for example, the body, the face, or the um, the bed, and and the like of that. For hadha mustahab. So this is recommended. Why? Because in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, uh, Aisha radiyallahu anha, she said, "Tayyabtu Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam li ahramihi hina yuhrim." I put uh, perfume on the Prophet وسلم, when he got into the state of Ihram and when he left the state of Ihram before he made the final tawaf of the house. So if something which is from the Sunnah to put tib on the body and on the Ihram. So we mentioned that the first place that the perfume is to put, put on is the body. The second place where the perfume can be put on uh, being Sunnah is that it's put on the thiyab, on the clothing. فَإِن كَانَ بِزَعْفَرًا فَمُحَرَّمْ بِالْإِجْمَاعِ So Sheikh Mansour says, if it's with za'faran, the, 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 the nice smell comes with za'faran, uh, saffron, then this is something which is haram by consensus, by ijma'. The hadith Ibn Umar, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, where he said that the Prophet said, وَلَا تَلْبَسُوا مِنَ الثِّيَابِ شَيْئًا مَسَّهُ زَعْفَرًا And don't wear anything from clothing which has been touched by za'faran. أو روس أو روس والروس نبات طيب رائحة and rose is that plant which gives off a good smell so you can put the um, the perfume on the clothing of the ihram before getting into the state of ihram but it should not have anything from saffron from zafaran because that would make it haram and the ruling in the madhab the um, the agreed, the famous opinion, the uh, mashhur opinion in the madhab is that to put the tib, to put the perfume onto the ihram is that which is makru, is that which is disliked. Okay, this is the ruling for putting on tib on the ihram before entering into the state of being a muhrim, before entering into the state of um, being a muhrim. So it's makru. However, this makru state can become a haram state in the situation where a person takes off the ahram for whatever reason and then puts it back on whilst it has perfume on it. So in the first instance, the person can wear it according to the madhab, it's makru, according to our author, it's sunnah, that you can wear perfume on the ahram uh, as you're getting into the state of ahram. But once you're in the state of ahram, if you take that clothing off, okay, what you wear for ahram, and then you put it back on, now it becomes haram because now you have, um, it's as though you have put on the perfume after being in the state of ihram. So in this situation, it's not allowed. So once the person is in the state of ihram, he's not allowed to put on perfume. But he can put it on before, the, in being, being in the state of uh, ihram. However, that would mean that it's makru. I hope I'm not confusing you, inshallah. Uh, the author, he says, min And to remove clothing, which is makhit. Okay, this is also sunnah, to remove any clothing which has stitching in it. And makhit doesn't just mean stitching, it means that that clothing, huwa ma fusila ala qadr malbus alayhi. It is that clothing which when it is uh, made for, for wearing over parts of your body. 
Um, what do the ulama they mean by this? They mean that, for example, any clothing like a jacket, if you were to put it on in the normal way that it's worn, then this will be something which is forbidden. However, if you were to take that clothing and to just throw it off your shoulders, now you are wearing that clothing in a way which it was not made to be worn. So then it would be permissible for you to wear. So it's like, for example, if somebody has a coat and he puts his arms through the sleeves of the coat on a cold day whilst he's in a haram, then this would be something which is forbidden for him to do and he would have to pay a penalty. However, if he got that coat and he just threw it over his shoulders or over his, over his shoulders, yes, or wore it like a blanket over himself, then that would be permissible and it wouldn't be considered as being something which is haram. So he should remove his clothing um, before entering into the state of haram. This is something which is sunnah. But of course, once you enter into the state of haram, thereon, thereafter, from the moment you've entered into the state of haram, it's forbidden for you to wear clothing. So what we're talking about here being sunnah for you to remove the clothing is that it's sunnah that you can, you're wearing your ihram, but you don't have to move, remove your clothing. It's sunnah for you to remove it. But once you reach the miqat and you enter into the state of ihram, at that moment, it's haram for you to wear any clothing. We're talking about before reaching the miqat and before reaching the state of, of being a muhrim, before reaching the state of ihram, it's sunnah for you to remove your clothing underneath the ihram. وَيَحْرُمُوا فِي إِزَارٍ وَرِدَاءٍ أَبْيَضَيْنِ And the person wears as, a, as a, his ihram clothing, he wears the izar and the rida, and they should be white. الْحْرَامِ فِي إِزَارٍ وَرِدَاءٍ فَالْإِحْرَامِ وَاجِبْ لَكِنَ سُنَّةً أَنْ يَحْرُمْ فِي إِزَارٍ وَرِدَاءٍ So Sheikh Mansour, he says that ihram is wajib, but the sunnah is to wear the izar and the rida, and they should be white color. والإزار ما يشد على الوسط and the izar is that which you tie around the middle of your body so it's a wrap that you tie around your waist والرداء ما يرتدي على المنكبين and the الرداء is that which you throw and wear over your shoulders and the evidence is the hadith of Ibn Umar رضي الله عنه uh, collected by Imam Ahmad where he said the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said وليحرم أحدكم في إزار ورداء ونعلين that one of you should get into the state of إحرام with a رداء with the izarin and the rida and uh, sandals. Okay, so the ulama they say though the sunnah is that you should wear white uh, clothing for the ihram, you can wear other than white if you wish to do so. The author says, that the person should get into the state of ihram and wear the ihram after having prayed two rak'ah. Sheikh Mansour says, وَإِنْ يَكُونُ إِحْرَامُهُ بَعْدَ صَلَاةِ الرَّكَعَتَيْنِ That the ihram is after praying two raka'ah. وَالْمُرَادْ أَنَّهُ يَجْعَلْ إِحْرَامَهُ عَقِبَ صَلَاةِ نَفْلٍ أَوْ فَرْضٍ And the intent is that the person puts on his ihram or gets into the state of ihram after having prayed nafl prayer, any nafl prayer or any fard prayer. So it's not specific salah for the ihram. It's just a sunnah that the person should put on the ihram, gets into the state of ihram after having prayed a nafl prayer or having prayed a fard prayer. وَالدَّلِيلُ ذَلِكْ مَا فَعْلَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ And the evidence of that is what the Prophet صلى الله did. فَإِنَّهُ أَهَلَّ دُبْرَ صَلَاةِ Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه got into the state of ihram after salah. قَالَ تِرْمِدِي And Imam Tirmidhi he said, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَسْتَحِبُّهُ أَهْلُ الْعِلْمِ And it is that which is recommended by the majority of the scholars, uh, the people of knowledge. And يُحْرِمَ رَجُلُ فِي دُبْرِ صَلَاةِ That the person puts the ihram on, gets into ihram state after having prayed. Uh, a salah, whether it's two rak'ah or more than that. وَنِيَّتُهُ شَرْطٌ And repeating, the author is repeating something which he mentioned previously, that the niyyah, to have the intent to be in the state of ihram, and the intention to do these rituals of hajj or umrah, is condition. It's something which is a shart, it's a condition. فَلَا يَكُونُ مُحْرِمًا إِلَّا بِنِيَّةِ الدَّخُولِ فِي النُّسُكِ So the person is not a muhrim, except with the intent to enter upon the rights of hajj and umrah. فَلَوْ لَبِسَ إِحْرَامَهُمْ بِدُونِ نِيَا So if the person was to wear the ihram clothing but he didn't have the intention وَالتَّجَرُّدْ مِنَ الْمَخِيدِ And he removed his clothing فَهَذِي الْحَيْئَةَ لَا تَكْفِي فِي جَعْلِهِ مُحْرِمًا So this, is, this situation and uh, state doesn't suffice the person for becoming a muhrim حَتَّى يَنْوِ الدُّخُولِ فِي النُّسِكْ لِيَعْتَبَرْ مُحْرِمًا Until the person intends that he has now become into the state of being a muhrim doing the acts of hajj and the acts of uh, Umrah, 
that only makes him a muhrim. So it's the intention which makes him into the state of being a muhrim. And the evidence, as we know, is the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, إنما الأعمال بالنيات. The author, he says, قوله, اللهم إني أريد نسك كذا فيسره لي. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I intend such and such right, so make it easy for me. Shaykh Mansur, he says, أن يكون إهلالهم بهذه الصفة. That the person gets into the state of ihram in this particular way. فَيَنْوِ الْإِحْرَامِ بِقَلْبِهِ So he makes the ihram the intention with his heart that I am now in the state of ihram, I am now a muhrim. ثُمَّ يُعَيِّنُ مَا يُحْرِمْ بِهِ وَيَلْفَظْ بِهِ And then he specifies what he is intending and he states what he is intending. فَيَقُولُ مَثَلًا اللَّهُمَ إِنِّي أُرِيدُ الْإِحْرَامِ بِأُمْرَةِ So he says for example, O oh Allah, I am intending and I want to be in a state of ihram for umrah, I want to perform umrah. أو بالحج أو فحج فيسره لي and make it easy for me وتقبل مني and accept it from me وأي إبارة قالها فإنها تجزئه and any statement that he makes in order for this to be um, acted upon then that suffices him it doesn't have to be a particular statement ولا يجب بشيء ولا يجب شيئا منها بالاتفاق and it's not uh, compulsory that he says any particular statement uh, by the agreement of all scholars. It doesn't have to be a particular statement which is said. The author he said, وَإِنْ حَبَسَنِي حَابِسٌ فَمَحَلِّي حَيْتُ حَبَسْتَنِي And if something prevents me from continuing and completing my rituals, then فَمَحَلِّي فَمَحَلِّي Then my um, state of hell, my state of being able to remove the ihram, it's from the place where you prevented me from continuing. So wherever Allah decrees, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for a person that, for example, they get sick at a particular place or something like an enemy prevents them from continuing to fulfill the rights of Hajj or Umrah, then if the person makes this shart that وَإِنْ حَبَسْنِي حَابِسٌ فَمَحَلِّي حَيْثُ حَبَسْتَنِي that, O oh Allah, um, wherever you have prevented me, from continuing to fulfill the Hajj or the Umrah, then I'm going to free myself from the obligations of Ihram at that point. Then the person is able to remove the Ihram from himself. So this is known as Ishtirat, Al Ishtirat in the Ihram. Ishtirat, making a condition at the time of Ihram. Wasifatuhu, and its description, as mentioned by Sheikh Mansur, and Yaqula in the Ihramihi, that the person says at the time of entering into Ihram, In Habasani Habisun, Fumahalli Haitu Habastani. إن حبسني حابس فمحلي حيث حبستني. That if something prevents me from continuing, then I will free myself from the ihram at that place where I was prevented from continuing. أي إحلالي من نسكي في موضع الذي حبست فيه. As I said, that um, I am free from the ihram at the place where I was prevented by you, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, from completing my Hajj or Umrah. والأصل في الاشتراط and the foundation in making the اشتراط the, the proof uh, for making this اشتراط this condition is the hadith of دباعة the hadith of دباعة رضي الله عنها that أنها دخلت على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم that she entered upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said to her لعلك أردت الحج it's as though you want to make حج قالت والله لا أجدني إلا وجعة she said I find myself in a state of uh, severe pain. فَقَالَ لَهَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said to her, حُجِّي وَاشْتَرِطِّي Make hajj, but make this shart that we have been explaining. وَقُولِي and say, اللَّهُمَّ مَحَلِّي حَيْثُ حَبَسْتَنِي Oh Allah, my situation where I'm going to free myself from the ihram is the place where you prevent me from going any further. So if a person has an illness, and they fear that it might get worse or they fear that may, they may not be cured and unable to fulfill the rights of Hajj or they fear that there's some danger that may fall upon them then they are able to make this ishtirat and say oh Allah, mahalli haytu habastani Okay, oh Allah, that I'm going to free myself from the ihram without any penalties at that point with my, where my situation became extremely difficult and I cannot complete the Hajj and in one of the narrations in, uh, narrated by Imam Nisa'i the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّ لَكِ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكِ مَسْتَثْنَيْتِ That verily you will have upon your Lord that which you set as a condition or as an exception, meaning that you will have the reward and you will have the ability to free yourself from the ihram without having to make, uh, without having to pay any penalties. وَفَائِدُ الْإِشْتِرَاتِ أَمْرَانِ And the benefit, Shaykh Mansur said, of making the ishtirat, making this condition in the ihram is to 
The first of them, أَنَّهُ إِذَا عَاقَهُ عَائِقُ That if the person comes upon um, an, an uncontrollable situation مِنْ عَدُوٍ أَوْ مَرَضٍ From the like of an enemy or the like of severe sickness أَوْ ذَهَابْ نَفَقَتِهِ Or he loses his money فَلَهُ تَحَلَّلْ Then he will be able to free himself from the state of ihram and he won't have to pay a penalty. And also secondly, إِذَا حَلَّ لِعُذْرٍ فَلَا دَمَّ عَلَيْهِ وَلَا صَوْمٍ And if he frees himself from the ihram due to valid reasons like an enemy or a sickness or losing his money, then the person can remove himself from the ihram. There's no penalty upon him of paying dam, of paying the sacrificial animal or having to fast. Sheikh uh, Mutlaq Jasr, he mentions an interesting point. He says that the Hanabila, the Hanbili scholars, they say that this ishtirat, it's for anybody. The person doesn't even have to be sick, nor does the person have to fear that he's going to fall into some kind of um, evil. It can be anybody can say that if they want to do so. And what's the proof of this? He said that the Usuliyin, the scholars of Usul, they said, إِذَا كَانَ جِوَابْ لِسُؤَالٍ فَإِنَّهُ لَا مَفْهُومَ لَهُ They say that if the answer from the Prophet ﷺ is given to a question, then it is considered to be a question in that particular situation, then it's considered to be unrestricted. إِذَا كَانَ جِوَابَ لِسُؤَالٍ فَإِنَّهُ لَا مَفْهُومَ لَهُ Generally meaning that this situation is unrestricted, as mentioned by Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr, Hafidahullah, that anybody can make this ishtirat. It doesn't have to be a person who fears an enemy or fears that they will be sick or something of that nature. The author now he's going to speak quickly about the different types of hajj and he's going to mention what is the best of them in his opinion and the opinion of the madhab. He says, الأنساك, The best of the uh, rituals of hajj is tamattu'. الانساك في الحج ثلاثة شيخ منصور says that حج it has three different ways of doing it التمتع number one الافراد number two القران number three he says وأفضلها عند الحنابلة نسك التمتع and the best ritual way of doing the حج in the, with the Hanbali scholars is التمتع حج التمتع and the evidence is where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, الدليل ما ورد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمر وأمر أصحابه لما طافوا أن يحلوا that the Prophet ﷺ, he told his companions when they were making the tawaf for the umrah on the hajj that they were doing, uh, for the hajj that they were doing, that they were making the tawaf, the Prophet ﷺ said, turn it into an umrah. فَأَمْرَهُمْ بِالْإِنْتِقَالِ مِنَ الْإِفْرَادِ وَالْقِرَانِ إِلَى الْأُمْرَةِ So the Prophet ﷺ commanded them that this hajj that they are doing and they're making the tawaf for, that they should change their intention now into doing an umrah. So then they can finish the umrah and do the hajj later on. So this is tamattu'. This is hajj al-tamattu'. وَلَا يُنْقِلُهُمْ إِلَا إِلَّا إِلَى الْأَفْضَلْ وَالْأَكْمَلْ And the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't ask them to change except to that state which is better and more complete. So the Prophet ﷺ told his companions that were doing hajj ifrad, which is doing Hajj alone, or doing Hajj al-Qiran, which is doing Umrah and Hajj in one Hajj, without separating them. Uh, he told them to change it into Hajj al-Tamattu'. لِأَلَّنَ التَّمَتُّعُ مَنْسُوسٌ عَلَيْهِ فِي كِتَابِ لَا تَعَالَى Because Tamattu' is um, mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ تَمَتَّعَ بِالْأُمْرَةِ إِلَى الْحَجِّ فَمَسْتَيْسِ سَلَمْ مِنَ الْهَدِي That whoever does Hajj Tamattu' is better for them. بخلاف الإفراد والقران. So um, the ifrad and the qiran is not mentioned in the Quran, but hajj tamattu' is mentioned. And also لأن التمتّع يجتمع له الحج والأمرة. المتمتّع يجتمع له الحج والأمرة في أشهر الحج كاملين غير متداخلين. Sheikh Mansour is saying, and it's also better because the one who is متمتّع, the one who is doing the right of hajj tamattu', he joins between hajj and umrah in the same year. However, they are separate acts of worship. He would do one, ha- one uh, umrah and then finish from that, remove his ihram and then he will put his ihram on again and he will do a hajj. So he does both of these rites but they are separate, they are not joined like they are with regards to the, uh, the qiran. بخلاف, بخلاف الإفراد والقران, as opposed to the one who does ifrad or qiran. ولأن المتمتع يجتمع له الحج والأمرة في أشهر الحج كاملين غير متداخلين مع زيادة النسك وهو الدم and also there's an, there's an extra nusuk, there's an extra right from the rites of hajj that the person does which is that he sacrifices a sacrificial animal فكان ذلك أفضل من نسك لا يجتمع فيه ذلك so that is better than the other rites 
of being muf- of ifrad or qiran which don't have these issues in them walya anna nabiy sallallahu alayhi wasallam ta'assafa ala annahu lam yatamatta faqal and because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as in sahih muslim he regretted that he didn't do hajj tamatta so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said law anni istaqbaltu min amri ma istadbartu lam asuq alhadiya wa ja'altaha umra that had i been able to go back and change what had happened to me uh, or had I come across this situation again, my situation of Hajj, I would not have uh, brought along the sacrificial an- animal and I would have made it into an Umrah. What I had done, I would have made it into an Umrah so I could finish the Umrah and then, then do the Hajj thereafter and I would have been a Hajj Tamattu' Mutamattu' وَلِأَنَّ الْأَمَرْ بِالْتَمَطْعِ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ And of course the um, the Hajj Tamatta is from the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu and the statement is given precedence to the action of the Prophet Sallallahu because it could have been that the Prophet Sallallahu his action was specific to him. So what the scholars are saying here, what Sheikh Mansour is saying here, what also gives Hajj Tamatta status and preference is that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu had commanded Hajj Tamatta and that which is said upon his tongue is given preference over that which he himself does because it could be that what he did is specific to him alone. So in any case, the conclusion of what I've been mentioning for the last few minutes is that the Hajj at tamatta the one wherein you do Umrah and then you remove your Ihram and then you get back into the state of Ihram to do Hajj uh, within the month of Hajj, the months of Hajj, is Hajj at tamatta and that is better than the other Nusuk. The author he says, at tamatta wa sifatuhu an yuhrima bil umrati fi ashri al hajj wa yafruga minha. The tamatta is to do the umrah in the months of the hajj and then to finish from it. Thumma yuhrimu bil hajj fi amihi and then to then to the hajj uh, in the same year in the months of hajj as we mentioned. Sheikh Mansour he says, التمتق, يحرم, So the muhrim he gets into the state of ihram for umrah. الحج, and that is to be done in the months of hajj. So he does that completely with its tawaf and its sa'yi, and by shaving his head or trimming his hair or trimming the hair. ثُمَّ يَحِلُّ مِنْ إِحْرَامِهِ وَيَلْبَصْ ثِيَابَهُ Then the person removes his ihram, leaves the state of being a muhrim, and wears his normal clothing. وَقَبْلَ عَرَفَ يُحْرِمُ بِالْحَجِ And then before the day of Arafah, on the 8th in fact, the person gets back into the state of ihram and gets ready for the rites of hajj, and all of this should be done without having left Mecca. ثاني الإنساك the third the second of the uh, rituals is الإفراد وصفته and its description and يحرم بحجة فقط is to do only حج alone that the person gets into the state of إحرام for doing حج alone ولا يأتمر معها and there is no umrah with it ولا يشترط أن يأتي بأمرة بعد فراغه على الصحي and according to the correct opinion the person doesn't have to do an umrah after having done this حج ثالث الإنساك القران the third ritual of Hajj is Al-Qiran وله صورتان and it has two ways of doing it. The first of them أن يحرم بالعمرة والحج جميعا that the person gets into the state of Ihram and Hajj Ihram for doing Umrah and Hajj at the same time فيقول لبيك أمرة وحج so the person says لبيك أمرة and Hajj ويقصد الإطيان بالحج والعمرة so the person intends that he's going to do Hajj and Umrah in one, in one journey in one ritual. Hadith Umar radiallahu anhu marfu. Due to the hadith of Umar where the Prophet sallallahu said, Atani laylata atim in Rabbi, uh, an angel came to me from my Lord in the night. Fakal salli fi hadil wadi al mubarak. Pray in this blessed valley. Wakul umrati umratan fi hajjatin. And say umrah with hajj. Meaning join the umrah and the hajj in one ritual. So that is the first way of doing Qur'an, that the person when he gets into the state of Ihram, he has his intention that he's going to do the Umrah and the Hajj together. Another way, uh, Sheikh Mansour says, and يُحْرِمْ umrah that the person, he gets into the state of Ihram for Umrah alone. ثُمَّ يُدْخِلُ عَلَيْهِ الْحَجْ قَبْلَ شُرُوِي فِي And before he does the Tawaf of the Umrah, he enters Hajj 
upon that Umrah before he does the Tawaf. وَصُورَةُ ذَلِكَ مَا فَعَلَتْهُ Aisha. And this is taken from, and the, the description of this or the situation of this is taken from what Aisha radiallahu anha did. حَيْثُ أَحْرَمَتْ مُتَمَتِّعَةً Whereupon she made ihram as a mutamatti'ah. She wanted to do hajj, umrah, then hajj. وَلَمْ تَعْتِ بِالْأُمْرَةِ But she didn't do the umrah. بَلْ أَدْخَلَتَ الْحَجْ عَلَىٰ أُمْرَتِهَا Rather she changed her intention and entered the hajj upon her umrah. فَأَصْبَحَتْ مُحْرِمَةً بِحَجَّةٍ وَأُمْرَةٍ so she became a muhrimah uh, with hajj and umrah together, like the hajj of the Quran. And this should take place before doing the tawaf of the umrah. We're going to give some more information on this point that I've just mentioned in a few moments. It will become clearer, uh, the second type of Quran hajj. So the first type of Quran hajj, as we mentioned, was that you, you have the intention that you're going to do the umrah and the hajj together in one ritual. The second was that you had the intention that you're going to do umrah but before you did the tawaf of the umrah, you change your intention to hajj. And so we'll add more information to this in a few moments. The author, he says, وَعَلَى الْأُفْقِي دَمٌ And upon the ufuqi, he has to give them, he has to do a sacrificial animal. الْأُفْقِي نِسْبَةٌ إِلَى الْأُفْقِ أَنَّاحِيَةٌ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ أَوْ السَّمَاءِ So the ufuq is basically uh, the horizon. The ufuq is the horizon and the ufuqi is the one that comes from the horizon. وَيُرَاد بِهِ هُنَا And the intention here is مَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ أَهْلِ مكة. Is the one who is not a resident of Mecca بَلْ يَأْتِي مِنْ خَارِجِهَا Rather he comes from outside of Mecca. So Sheikh Mansur he says this is the one, the Ufuqi is the one that lived or came from outside of Mecca uh, more than the distance of Qasr, more than the distance wherein you would shorten your prayers when traveling which is 80 kilometers plus. And the dam that this person brings, the ufuqi person has to bring with him, or has to, sorry, not bring with him, has to do as part of his hajj, dam. He has to do dam al-shukr. He has to uh, do the ritual of slaughtering the sacrificial animal as a way of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, question to yourselves, why is it shukr? Why is it a sacrificial animal of shukr for the one who's mutamatta and he's ufuqi, he's not, he's not from the people of Mecca? Question, sorry, why is this sacrificial animal known as Dam Shukran, known as the sacrificial animal of thankfulness? Okay, the scholars, they say because he was able to join the Hajj and the Umrah in one year by freeing himself from the Ihram between them. So he did his uh, Umrah and then he freed himself from Ihram. He was able to come out of the state of Ihram and then to go back into it later for the Hajj. So this gave him some freedom and flexibility and gave him a lot of ease. So this is why the person has to do, has to pay the sacrificial animal as a shukr, as a thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he is ufuqi. Again, ufuqi meaning the one who comes from outside of Mecca from a distance of more than 80 kilometers. Sheikh, uh, the, the author, Al-Hajjawi, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, وَإِنْ حَادَتْ الْمَرْأَةُ فَخَشْيَتْ فَوَاتُ الْحَجِّ If the one who's making mutamatta, the woman, if she's, if she's making hajj tamattu, but now her period comes upon her, and she fears that she's going to miss hajj, أَحْرَمَتْ بِهِ وَصَارَتْ قَارِنَةً Then she changes her intention to be qarina. Right? She changes her intention to hajj of qiran. So what does this mean? Sheikh uh, Amir Bahjat, he gives a clear explanation of this. He says, ما سورة هذه المسألة? Let me give you an explanation, uh, a scenario of this situation. He said, هذه مرأة جاءت تريد تمتع فجاءت بأمرة. So this woman, she came to the Miqat and she wanted to make Hajj Tamatta. So she came with the intention that I'm going to come into the state of Ihram for Umrah, which is the first action that you do if you are doing Hajj Tamatta. تريد أن تحج متمتعة فجاءت من الميقات محرمة بعمرة. So she got to the Miqat and she passed it in the state of having the Ihram for Umrah. وصلت مكة يوم الثامن من ذي الحجة أو يوم السابع من ذي الحجة. So she gets to مكة on the seventh or the eighth day of ذي الحجة. احتجهت إلى المسجد الحرام. On her way to the Masjid al-Haram, وصلت عند الحرام فحاضت. She gets to the Masjid al-Haram and then suddenly her hayd has come upon her at that point. تقدر تطوف وهي حائد is she able to make tawaf in this situation while she is حائد ما تقدر تطوف وهي حائد she is unable to do tawaf in the situation while she is حائد 
So what does the author say to us? Ahramat bihi bil hajj. Yani ahramat bil hajj wujuban. She has to now leave the, the, the umrah and turn it into a situation of hajj. Why? Because she knows that she's not going to have enough time to become purified from her menses, right? The days of umrah will finish and the days of hajj will come upon her. So if she doesn't change her intention at this point, then she's not going to be, to be able to free herself from her ihram of uh, tamattu' until she does an umrah and she's not going to be able to do that within the time because hajj is going to start in a few days time. So this woman, what she has to do, فَهَذِهِ لَوْ مَا أَحْرَمَتْ فِي الْحَجْ لَفَاتَهَا الْحَجْ So this woman, if she doesn't change her intention to hajj, then she will lose the hajj. أَحْرَمَتْ بِهِ وَجُوبًا وَصَارَتْ قَارِنَةً So this woman, she has to make the intention at this point for hajj qiran and she will continue doing the hajj as qarinatan, as the one who is hajj qiran. And Imam Bahuti, he said it also applies to men. It could be a situation that a man, he gets to... He gets to uh, uh, he gets to the places of Hajj on Yom Al Arafah, on the the time of Arafah, right? So he's only now got a few hours for him to go and complete his Umrah in Mecca, but he fears now that if he goes to Mecca to do his Umrah, and then he comes back to do the standing a uh, wuquf bil Arafah, the standing on Arafah, he may not be able to complete the standing of Arafah, so he's going to lose that on his Hajj. So this person who came with the intention of doing Hajj Tamatta but he was delayed by traffic or by visa issues or whatever and he arrived very late to the Hajj then the way that he solves his problem is that he changes his intention from doing Hajj Tamatta to Hajj Qiran and then he goes ahead and continues without having to do the Umrah and he goes ahead and continues to do the Hajj Qiran Slightly technical issues here but the conclusion of it is that there were two types of Hajj Qiran that we mentioned, the first of them that is the person gets into the the Ihram with the intention of doing Hajj and Umrah together. So this is the first type of Hajj Qiran. The second is the situation that we've been discussing, that a person comes not with the intention of Hajj Qiran, but he comes with the intention of being Tamattu'. But due to a situation that comes upon the person, either due to menstruation or due to the person being delayed getting to Mecca, then the person is not going to be able to fulfill the Umrah in time. So the person changes the intention to being Hajj Qiran and continues to do Hajj in that situation, in that way. And Ibn Al-Qayyim in Zad Al-Ma'ad said that ijma, that there's ijma consensus upon the ulama that this can be done, meaning the change of intention if it's required to do so. The author, he said, وَإِذَا اسْتَوَى عَلَى رَاحِلَتِهِ قَالَ بَيْكَ اللَّهُمَ لَا بَيْكَ لَا بَيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَا بَيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَنَعْمَةَ لَكَ الْمُكْ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ That the person, when he gets upon his riding beast, he says these beautiful words of, of praise and glory and tawheed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another opinion in the madhab, as mentioned in Al-Iqna and Al-Muntaha, is that it said once the person enters into the state of Ihram after having prayed two raka'ah. So after the person gets into the state of the ihram and he prays those two raka'ah that we mentioned previously, that's from that time that the talbiya starts, the person starts saying la bayk Allahumma la bayk. It's not when the person gets on to the riding beast as mentioned by the author. So that's the second opinion in the madhab, is that it starts from the time the person has actually got into the ihram after having prayed the two raka'ah. Now there's a difference in meaning Shaykh Mutlaq Jasr Hafidullah he says there's a difference in meaning wherein the person says in alhamdulillah, in alhamda, or says an alhamda. If the person says an alhamda with a fatha on the alif hamza, he says an alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. If he says this, then it means that labayk Allahumma labayk, oh Allah, I'm responding to you because all of the hamd, all types of praise, they belong to you. That's what it means, the difference in meaning. Whereas if he says in alhamda, then the two sentences, the one that came before it, La Baik Allahumma La Baik, La Baik Allah Sharika Laka La Baik, or Allah, I'm responding to you, there is no partner for you, I'm responding to your call, then this is a separate sentence to, In Alhamda wa Ni'mata Laka Rulmuk La Sharika Laka. All praise and glory and favors belong to you, you have no partner. Then they would become two separate sentences uh, if you say Inna. But if you said Anna, then the second part of the sentence means that I'm responding to you, connected to, uh, the, the first part that I said, La Baik Allahumma La Baik, is connected to what I'm saying now, is that I'm responding to you because all praise and glory and perfection belong to you. 
just a slight grammatical difference point there. وَيُسَوِّتُ بِهَا الرَّجُلِ The person, the male person, makes this talbiya la baik Allahumma la baik. He makes this loud. Okay. A sunnah lirujal and yajharu bi talbiya. The sunnah for the men is that they make it loud, the talbiya loud, bi ittifaq al ulama, as a consensus with all the ulama. Imtithal ni amri nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, following the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kama fi hadith sa'ib ibn Khalad marfu'an, which is in Tirmidhi and it's authentic. Atani Jibreel, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jibreel alayhi wa sallam came to me, fa'amarani an amura ashabi, and then commanded me that I command my companions. And يَرْفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَهُمْ بِإِهْلَالِ That they raise their voices when making the ihlal, when getting to, into the state of ihram وَتَلْبِيَةً And making the talbiyah وَتَخْفِيفُهَا لِلْمَرْأَةِ And the woman, she lessens her voice uh, when doing so, uh, doesn't raise her voice because there could be men that are non mahram around her and her voice could be a temptation for those men and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best um, we'll stop here inshallah uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make anything I have said clear and beneficial for those listening and for myself also to increase us in knowledge and action we will continue next week by Allah's permission uh, looking at the details of mahdhurat al-ihram of those things which are forbidden for the person to do in the state of ihram and what are the penalties when the person falls into those things which are forbidden in the state of Ihram. If yep. anybody has a question, then feel free to ask. If not, we will stop here, inshallah. And bi we will see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.